I broke through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows ekrastic. I get drastic. Hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin. I'm Spencer, and today I'm joined by some very special guests. I have Tinsel Corey and Gil yeah. Birmingham. Um, from a long line of stuff, you guys have been in a couple decades at least for you, and at least almost a decade for you now at this point of acting. Um, probably most notably, you guys are known for the Twilight Saga series, since that's a multi-billion dollar film franchise. But um, I actually wanted to start with something that predated this, and it was something I learned that you guys both were in before Twilight, and that was Into the West. Mm -hmm. um, Into the West is kind of an interesting project, for those of you who don't know, that was produced by Steven Spielberg. It was on TNT, and it was about the westward expansion in America. Uh, the thing that I found interesting about it was that they used uh, multiple perspectives to tell the story, one from Native American and one for uh, the white westward expansion um thing that really popped to me though was that it was in part filmed in santa fe which is where i was from mm -hmm. um and growing up there you know a lot about the the you know the westward expansion the treatment of native americans all that sort of stuff what was it like to work on a project like that and how um i mean scale wise that had to be a pretty significant project how was it working on that um, well, you, you scared me there when we were both on the same project. I thought it was the Muscles video we did or something. Yes. No, you that up. Oh, Q, yeah. Q YouTube video, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. I knew we had to bring it up. Just well, you know, you, and you <laughs> touched upon a very serious matter, and here we're, we're joking about it. But, it, yeah, I, it, um, it, you know, I think we're, we're most proud about it because it's used in educational institutions. I mean, it was as factual as they could get it. There's some fictional characters that were uh, added to it, but um, I think it really honored the the struggles and the challenges that both, you know, the European uh, expansion and the native uh, impact, you know, that happened with that. But it was uh, it was a miniseries. There was there were six of them, so we had six different directors, very similar to Twilight, you know, having mm, five, four, interesting. four four different uh, directors. But uh, my experience was wonderful. Um, it was a beautiful experience for me. Um, it also made me reconnect um, with my culture. And just, it was interesting. Like, I remember this one time we were filming the Fort Laramie Treaty. Mm. And they were like, okay, so remember that you don't understand what he's saying to you. And so he's basically, like, giving away the land. And, and like, you know, we're supposed to not be knowing. Wow, and it, makes, it yeah. made you really angry. And just sort of, like, you were like, oh, wow, this is what it was, you know, like, like. And, um it was very powerful just to be on there, and and Steven Spielberg did a really great job and of, of finding cultural advisors and trying to stay true to this true to the story. Well, I, I mean, I think one of the things that was most interesting to me is that they actually went to the trouble of having both perspectives told. I mean, it seems like so much of the time it's just completely overlooked and sort of glossed over. And to you speak about you know pretending you don't understand what's going on, and that's that's sort of a weird thing because you have to act like you're not conscious of right. what's going on but at the same time you're getting so angered by what's going on how do you how do you sort of like temper that in acting like it must be a kind of complicated challenge um no you just i mean you just i'm a method actor so i just fully enveloped so i was like i understood it so inside you're having that but you know outwardly you're like okay just remain calm and then you know you express the anger like you know afterwards or, or just take in what you know what you've just sort of experienced later I, I was part of the um, the wounded needs need uh, scene where the, the women and children were, were massacred um, and uh, that was such an intense experience and I, and I remember because they're they're very often long shoots you know 12 14 15 hour days we had a lot of extras involved and as can be expected you know towards the, you know the 14 15 hours people are getting tired you know we're doing the running we're doing the explosions but I said, and I kind of grabbed them and I said, listen, we, we need to honor these people. We're, we're just acting like this thing happened. There's people that lived and died by this thing. Uh, so when you get those that close of an experience to what the, something must have been like, it's, um, it's really kind of life changing. And, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting that they went to the trouble of making that dual frames. I mean, I'm trying to think of, you know, some sort of equivalent type experience, maybe, you know, uh, Flags of Our Fathers and Leathers mm -hmm. to, from Iwo Jima. Yeah. Um, 
what what is it like you know you're growing up with a as a native american and to not i mean obviously you probably don't get to see much of your culture fairly represented i mean i, I grew up in santa fe new mexico and you they the, it's almost a joke to see sort of the past not i mean not joke in a funny way but it's sort of sad mm -hmm. to see how the treatment of native americans have been you know from the spanish you know the americans um etc did this finally portray Native American culture in a fair way, in your opinion? Do you, do you feel like this is sort of finally giving a window to what it was really like back then? Or, how, I mean, how do you view this in terms of Native American culture in cinema and television? Yeah, I mean, I think the Into the West series was really a turning point, um, and which was why they're using it in schools. And Steven Spielberg really wanted to portray it in the fairest light of, of both sides, but also because of the way that um, Native Americans have been portrayed in Hollywood for a very, very long time. So I think that that series definitely was a turning point for people to see the other perspective of what still is history books a lot of times is written wrong. Yeah, I think it, it it was a long time coming and, and rewriting the history, you know, more factually than the way it had been portrayed for so many, you know, hundreds of years prior to that. And uh, you really have to tip your hat to Steven Spielberg for trying to keep the integrity of the story. All right. So moving on to more <laughs> major <laughs> successful Hollywood project you guys have been involved with. Um, you both were involved with the Twilight Saga, which is why you're out here for the release of Breaking Dawn Part 1 on DVD. Uh, we'll start sort of in the beginning of Twilight and go kind of chronologically through because it, it's going to be, uh, there's a whole lot going on there. Um, I will admit I've never read the books, which is one of the things I wanted to ask you about. Uh, when you got this project, was the first thing, I mean, you were in the first one, obviously you were not, but was did you go out and read the books? Were you conscious of this as sort of like a literary phenomena at that point? Or what was your sort of perspective? Because Twilight, at least at that point, was purely a literary thing, not like a movie, media, bonanza, sort of. I think every artist approaches it differently. Um, my experience was trying to establish the characters and the chemistry between the characters, or the, the dynamics, um, and contemporizing it. Uh, my character was slightly cast differently. I mean, in the book, he's he's a, a paunchy guy and he's old and wrinkled, or older and wrinkled. And uh, but it, it was more important to kind of portray the relationships. Um, and so much of the book really is the thought process of Bella, is Bella's perspective. Mm -hmm. So that's that's an additional challenge for a filmmaker to kind of get on screen what's going on in this young lady's mind and her her sense of seeing things. You uh, played Billy Black, I believe, uh, and you were the father of Jacob, which is kind of a pretty significant role when you think about, you know, the character structure of the entire film. I mean, he's one of the main three. Uh, you're directly influencing him. And it was kind of interesting for me to sort of go back and look um, through Twilight Wikipedia, which is very extensive, let me tell you. Um, so much of what happens to your character actually seems to occur before uh, the, the film actually begins. You know, uh, your accident where you get hurt, um, the fact that you do not turn into a werewolf because there were no vampires around when you were, uh, I guess, growing up. What is it like to sort of try and come to terms with a character where so much of it you have to convey through your actions and sort of try and explain all this stuff to people who have no idea about it. Like I had no, like this is fascinating stuff. I was like, wow, that is a really interesting backstory. I would have liked to have seen that in the movie, but obviously you weren't given the opportunity to really get too deep into that stuff. How, how do you sort of convey that to an audience without them knowing? I, I you know, that's, now you're getting into our process, you know? <laughs> um, yeah, you research the material and, and the character and then, you know, part of, of the uh, the craft, I guess you would call it, is releasing it, you know, and trusting that everything you've assimilated is going to come out, and just the, you know the body language or, or the phrasing of words or the ways of saying things. Uh, but I thought it was important too that uh, the, the native community be portrayed in a contemporary sense because so many times it's it's period stuff, 
So I wanted to bring that to it as well. And the fact that people's lives, you know, native lives, have a rich culture to them. This has a lot of supernatural things. I mean, my, my character is the direct descendant from the first werewolf, and this is where the werewolves were actually able to transform. Um, so I, I think it's just a lot of trust, trust in the process and, and your own, um, your own uh, I don't know, craft. And Tinsel, you came in in New Moon playing Sam's fiance Emily. Mm -hmm. um, for those who don't know, Emily is the, or sorry, Sam is the alpha wolf at that time. Um, and similarly, a little bit more, you have a pretty interesting backstory in terms of like, you know, he had a relationship with this other girl, Leia, like that goes south. He, was it a, uh, he imprints mm -hmm. on you, you sort of go against that, he ends up scarring you pretty badly. Like, in the movies at least, it's it's touched upon, but it's it's much more extensive than it, it is on film. Uh, was it a challenge to sort of try and find a balance with this character who's very complex, or was more stuff filmed that ultimately was cut? Like, how exactly? No, I mean, unfortunately, you know, I. The Leah Sam Emily triangle was so interesting. Yeah, Obviously, it's like I was, equally as interesting <laughs> as the main three. And like, I was very disappointed that you know didn't um, didn't come into play in the film. And I think a lot of times people wonder why each of the Twilight stars is so like people grab onto that the fans grab mm -hmm. on, but they don't realize that we have these massive storylines that are attached yeah, to each no, one of us. I, 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 <laughs> believe me, I'm telling you right here. Like I've se I'd seen the movies, but I'd never read the books and. Uh, going back and getting ready for this, I was I was looking through. I was like, oh, I, I mean, I knew I recognized your names. I know who you are in the films, but I obviously didn't know like the extent the of the backstory. And yeah. it's, it's it is amazing. It's almost like a spin-off film should be done for this. They it's should like, do a spin-off. The werewolf story. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, what is it like to sort of you know be a character on the side with so much of your own material and you know, kind of kind of get not swept to the side, but sort of a lot of it has to be cut out because of just time constraints. Right, and I, and I know that, and I think that's why no matter, like, I mean, I could have just read the lines for what I had in sure. the film, but you really are this character outside of the film, too. We do a lot of Twilight conventions, mm -hmm. so it's really important for, I think, us to have that full background and have that full understanding um, of who our characters are, and then that's just easy to portray, so when you jump on screen, that scene just, like, comes naturally. So for me, it's, you know, like, I went down to the Quileute Nation, I taught acting out to their kids over there and then I went wow. to the Macaw Nation um, and uh, spent some time with their kids and so I you know taking that drive from Macaw to like Quill you, uh -huh. I was like oh this is what Emily would do so I have a very wow. rich understanding yeah, of like cool. what my character like who my character is so when you jump on screen it's just right there and by the time you got into the film, I, I mean, Twilight 1 had come out. It had been a huge success. You know, they're quickly trying to put all the other ones into production. What was it like for you coming into the series? Because when Gil was in it, like, the books were obviously very popular. But, you know, who knows how things transition to films. I mean, Golden Compass, big book series, never really hit on yeah. film. What was it like coming in? Was there a lot of pressure to sort of, you know, this is going to be a major franchise, you know, we need you to play this part? Uh, were you a fan of the series before then? What was it like coming into something that's a big, big deal? Um, I didn't realize how big it was because even when I got cast, Twilight was just picking up steam. I think it just had released internationally at that point. Mm -hmm. So it was starting, but I didn't know how big it was actually going to be. Um, so while we were filming, there were like some paparazzi, but nobody really knew who, you know, who we were or like what was going on. Um, and so until like it actually released, that's when it's like, I was like, oh, what is this thing that I'm a part yeah. of? Um, and in sort of the, the scheme of things, I mean, you know, it's Jacob, Edward, Bella, that's sort of like the core trium triumvirate. Uh, but there's sort of two sides in the movie, you know, there's the werewolves and the vampires. What is it like sort of filming a movie that sort of there's this dividing line? Were the actors sort of, you know, sort of separated into the two parties? Was it really, were people divided on set just to sort of keep in that mindset? Was it like, you know, working within that sort of, 
world, so to speak. Well, I mean, we're definitely divided because it really is like shooting a completely different movie. Um, you know, I hadn't met like a lot of the Cullens because we don't have the same filming schedule, you know. So Cullens come in and the high school kids and then the wolves. And, you know, we're divided not because we don't like each other, but because it was just the way that the time factor was. Yeah, I think the stories um, didn't interact that much except for the three main characters, mm-hmm. uh, at least those the tribe and, and, the, and the vampires. So... You know, there was a natural separation just in the telling of the story. And it wasn't until I think the wedding scene on Breaking Dawn that I realized I'm here with all the, all the vampires, you know, and I haven't done any scenes that way. So it's, it's very interesting. But to be fair, Gil, you are actually one of the ones who sort of deals the most with the outside of world of them. I mean, you were right there from the beginning with Bella. I mean, you work with Charlie or deal with Charlie's you know, the character of Charlie, a lot. Um, in, in a lot of ways, you are sort of the, I, I mean, I guess olive branch. I mean, th- all the other ones, you know, Jacob, Sam, all of them are much, much more sort of violent, organized, sort of driven that way. But you kind of somewhat play peacemaker. You know, you know, push Jacob to uh, talk to Bella. You do these things. What is it, what is it like as sort of that character? You know, you're sort of, in between, I mean, there's obviously the battle between vampires and werewolves, but you're sort of even between just sort of like both of those. You're like middle ground almost. That seems like a complicated character to sort of find. It is. It is. You know, he was somewhat of the um, the spiritual leader. I mean, he carried the lineage of the werewolf. And, you know, all the times he told this story, you know, that the, the young kids thought it was, oh, it's, you know, it's Billy telling the stories of the, of the natives again. Um and it brings in the natural, the supernatural aspect to it. So, uh, yeah, it, it's it, it was a conflicting place to be, and I found myself experiencing that a lot. It, basically, knowing that we have an obligation to protect the, the tribe and the people, um, and making a truce basically is what I was operating from. We'll have this truce as long as you guys stay off our land, as long as people aren't killed. But and at the same token, I have a very close relationship to Charlie and his daughter. Mm-hmm. And once I realize that she's finding interest in a vampire, well, then you know, I already want my son. You know, check his abs out, man. Come on, <laughs> Edward doesn't have that. <laughs> it's funny to think, and you know, as the series goes on, it seems. I mean, the scale seems to get bigger and bigger. The audience seems to get bigger and bigger. The books are selling more DVDs. How how is that sort of? Do you feel like you're in a fishbowl as this thing has gone on? Because it seems like, besides perhaps Harry Potter, this is the biggest franchise in the world. I mean, I can't think of anything that is bigger than it. I mean, do you feel the entire world sort of? watching your guys' movie, you know, every time you guys go to film in Vancouver, wherever, it's like, up, oh, you know, Twilight's filming now, you know. I imagine talk about paparazzi and stuff. Is that something that you guys really feel around you? Do you feel like everyone is sort of watching you? Um, you mean like in the sense of getting recognized and, and that? Um, I actually don't get recognized because I have a big scar that covers half my face. Um, so I've been able to keep my anonymity. Um, and I think it's really heightened mainly when we're filming. Uh, what's interesting is that once you say Twilight, everyone has like an auntie or a sister or like someone who's like a huge fan of Twilight. That's like a real. that's a really interesting thing of what I found about that sort of like fishbowl sense of what you're talking about. I think it's it's so much more concentrated on on the, the you know Christian and, and Rob and Taylor, um, so we don't have the same degree of it. But in a similar way, you know, most people I recognize my character in a wheelchair. So you know, if I'm walking around the streets, you know, that well that can't be him. He kind of looks like that guy though, you know. And and I don't know that you can carry. It's it's tough to imagine trying to carry that that weight, you know, of the enormity of of this phenomena. You know, because you really still have, we're still people, actors, you know, and, and we want to practice our craft. We want to do good projects, and we were just very lucky to be part of this one. And you sort of, you talk about the Twilight phenomenon, you know, everybody knows somebody who loves it. And I, I definitely can speak to that. Like, I haven't read the books, but I definitely know plenty of people, like, in my office or whatever, like, oh, yeah, you should you should totally read the books. You want to read that one before Breaking Dawn 2 comes out? I don't know. Um, but... 
there's certain, I mean, Twilight seems, I mean, I guess it's the same as sort of Harry Potter, where there is like one audience that's really die hard and, you know, you have that audience captivated or whatever. What about the non-Twilight fans? How do you, how do you sort of approach them? The people who might not understand it, might be resistant to it. Do you feel like an ambassador to it, sort of? Like I don't want to doubt, like, if somebody doesn't want to watch Twilight, I'm not going to be like, you have to watch this. Um, you know, either you connect with something or you don't connect with something, and some people are going to and some people don't. I'm not the biggest fan of vampires, but I love the wolf side, and that's just not biased because, like, you know, I'm on the wolf pack, but that's just for me, that's what I would take out of the film. Um, um, so I, I don't think it's about convincing somebody. And I think the one thing that people don't get, because they're like, what's it with the wolves and the vampires? Like, what's so interesting? I think what people connect with it is that first love feeling. Mm. Uh, the first love is always the most intense feeling. And so you're just automatically connected to that. And I think that's what it sort of s- sparked in, um, in, in people and why they really like it. Yeah, I, th- I think it's the feminine energy, you know, that people, it, mostly women, you know, are, feel so free to express. But that's not to say that there's not, you know, guys out there either. And I, it's been an interesting observation because of the phenomena, you know. And when we meet the fans, you know, we, we, you'll see people's eyes tear up, you know, and it means so much to them. So socially, you know, the, the social observation of what, what is touching people on such a global level is really kind of revealing and, and interesting and, and a real fascinating study for me. And in terms of breaking down, you know, you got part one coming out on DVD, was it this Friday, Tuesday? Tonight, actually, Tonight. midnight. Okay, midnight, midnight Friday, the 9th of February, which is today? That's the 10th. 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 Okay. Tenth. Um, <laughs> what date is it? Yes, I don't know. I'm, I'm terrible <laughs> with dates. Um, so part one has come out, part two is coming. What is it like to sort of come to this culmination of a franchise? I mean, I guess, again, Harry Potter was sort of the same thing where there's this huge anticipation for the end of this thing because it was such a massive phenomenon. How do you sort of come to closure with the series, with your characters, with everything? Um, I don't, for me, every character that I've played always holds a special part Mm -hmm. in my heart. So I never really let them go completely. I think they help me grow as a person. so, and by ending it, I mean, I even thought, oh, okay, you know, the Breaking Dawn premiere came out, this is over, and it was like, done. and then I'm on this, like, DVD tour. So, as much as you think it's over sometimes, it's not. And we do Twilight conventions, so I don't really think that this actually has an ending. I think this is like, you know, the Star Wars and, like, the Lord of the Rings where it's going to carry on for a long time. You know, in 10 years from now, they're, do- they're doing the super deluxe DVD edition of all the Twilight, you know, it's... I don't think it's going to end. I think it's going to keep going. We were talking the other day about, you know, the possibility of 25 years from now, somebody wanting to remake Twilight, you know, and how tough that would be. But, um, yeah, if it's, it's a one-of-a-kind kind of, um, you know, project that um, I, I, they always stay with you. Like, I agree with that. The characters stay with you. And as you're going through it, you're learning, not just from your own life experience and the reactions that you're, you're going through. But the, the characters as well, you know, and, and what, what they, how they imprinted upon yourself. And I actually don't think you really can let go of a character because for some people, you know, I'll always be Emily or you'll always be Billy, you know, like Captain or Picard or whatever, you know, all the Star, oh, yeah, Star Trek yeah. fans. Like he'll always be that to, you know, mm-hmm. those fans out there. So it's like you never really get away from those characters, which is a good thing. So you got part one uh, out. Part two is coming out, which I believe both of you are in. I believe, you believe that? <laughs> I believe that, yeah. but I could be we, wrong. We want to believe it too. Um, <laughs> so what what else do you guys have coming up? Where else can people, you know, find more information about you? What projects can they look forward to? I'm, I know you're a musician as well, so you probably got stuff going on there. Yeah, I'm in the studio right now working on my first music EP. Um, and I'm a big tweetaholic so i have a twitter page twitter.com slash tinsel um so i'm always keeping people updated on my crazy thoughts and <laughs> randomness um and then i have a movie coming out on sci-fi on february 25th called black forest where these um the fairy tale world is mad at us for not believing them any in the more and they come and attack us so <laughs> that was a really fun project in, in bulgaria where we shot it more supernatural i know i'm stuck in sci-fi <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'm presently doing a uh, several episode arc on a show similar demographic, The Lion Game, uh, similar demographic as Twilight, because there's a lot of people who are crossing over on that. Uh, another love story. Um, 
and I have a movie coming out that I did with Brandon Routh called um, Crooked Arrows, uh, a lacrosse movie, and touching on the the native origin of lacrosse. And then we're gearing up to start uh, a movie called The Lone Ranger with Johnny Depp. Uh, that's pretty. That's a pretty big deal. I think that's back down in New Mexico as well. Actually, yeah, yeah. Um, keeping tabs on that. You can see <laughs> uh, websites. Uh, you spoke of Twitter. What about a website? Yeah, just tinselcorey dot com. Yeah, I've I've got the Facebook Gil Birmingham, and then I got uh, the Twitter page, and I and I follow you. I, I'm watching everything you tweet. <laughs> so follow me. <laughs> Uh, very cool. Thank you guys so much for coming out to promote Twilight Breaking Dawn Part 1 on DVD, February 10th. You can find more interviews and stuff at MacGuffinPodcast.com. And, again, good luck with everything going forward, and we'll mm. keep tabs on where you go next. Thank, Thank you so very much. much. Thanks for having Thanks. us. can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Magneto can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. It's tight. Don't even try it by the same style. Mr. Spock can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Borg can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels all right.